Uh, we're gonna. Uh, we're waiting to get cued by the t television. Uh, thank you very much. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Gunter, and I'm here uh, to uh, welcome you on behalf of the uh, Nuclear Free Tacoma Park Committee. Um, a little bit about the committee. Uh, we were formed by a um, uh, 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 decision, an ordinance. Uh, uh, in 1983 uh, that um, essentially established uh, the city of Tacoma Park as a nuclear free zone. Um, the uh, goals of the uh, nuclear free zone are to uh, prohibit the uh, production of nuclear weapons in the city of Tacoma Park, uh, but also to uh, establish a boycott of nuclear weapons manufacturers with any uh, uh, contracts that the city would have. So the overall response has been uh, an, an, an awareness of the issues of nuclear um, armaments and uh, the need to abandon uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, tonight, uh, we're, we have a special event um, where we are commemorating um, a couple of uh, nuclear disasters. Uh, the very first nuclear weapons test over 70 years ago uh, in the New Mexico desert, the Trinity nuclear test uh, was um, the uh, precursor to the atomic bombing of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Um, and since then, the issue of nuclear uh, weapons proliferation, nuclear testing, um, uh, continues to be uh, a major concern and threat to humanity. But also, uh, 36 years ago today, uh, there was a, um, a uranium mill uh, spill in Church Rock, New Mexico, uh, where nine, over 90 million gallons of radioactive waste was um, spilled from a broken dam uh, that uh, spilled into the Rio Puerco, uh, a river in New Mexico, uh, some uh, 350 Navajo uh, sheep herder families uh, lived on on that land, uh, and uh, it was uh, just uh, uh, weeks after the uh, the the accident at Three Mile Island uh, in 1979. But um, it's it's to, to date, it's still one of the uh, forgotten nuclear disasters here in the United States, uh, but is general is still generally part of the awareness that we need to cultivate. Um, as we strive for a nuclear-free world. Um, the, um, what we'd like to do, uh, first of all, before we get to our featured speakers tonight, is show you a, a short video uh, by Aseo Hashimoto, a Japanese visual artist, uh, who produced a time-lapse map of every uh, nuclear weapons explosion on the Earth since 1945. And so we'll begin that uh, with with that that video
Okay. If we could have the lights. Okay, thank you very much. So over over 2,000 nuclear weapons tests. And um, we're, the concern is, is that we continue to see the threat of uh, nuclear proliferation and uh, a concern about the resumption of nuclear testing even. Um, tonight we have uh, two um, uh, featured speakers uh, to uh, address this issue of nuclear uh, weapons proliferation. Uh, our first speaker tonight is uh, uh, Bob Alvarez. Um, Bob is uh, not only um, a Tacoma Park resident, but he's also a, um, a senior uh, science advisor for the uh, International Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. Um, he's a, a noted um, uh, nuclear uh, weapons critic, and um, he's uh, also advised uh, the uh, uh, U.S. government um, and U.S. Senate on uh, nuclear uh, weapons issues, and uh, he's uh, also a humanitarian. Uh, he's been engaged as an expert witness on the behalf of, uh, for example, the Marshall Islanders uh, who were subjected to nuclear weapons testing. Uh, and uh, uh, testified on, on their behalf uh, in, in the humanitarian effort. Um, uh, Bob is here tonight to discuss uh, with us about uh, the ongoing uh, ish and efforts to uh, outlaw nuclear weapons and also the, the latest news on the uh, Iranian uh, deal that uh, has just been negotiated. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. So I guess I need to get heat up here. Just press the magic button. Oh, this one here, isn't it? Oh, there's one in the right. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple things tonight. One is the humanitarian initi initiative to outlaw nuclear weapons, and also just a a brief talk about uh, uh, the the agreement that the uh, United States and uh, five other nations have reached with uh, Iran relative to their nuclear program. Um, in February of this year, uh, the Republic of the Marshall Islands filed a lawsuit uh, in federal court and in the International Court of Justice uh, against the nuclear weapons states who you have seen have detonated all these nuclear weapons, uh, asserting that they violated both the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, Article 4 of the treaty, which requires the nuclear weapon states to engage in good faith negotiations for disarmament, uh, but also uh, to, to uh, uh, basically invoking international law. Uh, for those who don't know much about the Marshall Islands, it was a trust territory that was seized from the Japanese after World War II, uh, several weeks after the United States uh, seized control, they, they basically paid a local dealer $10 for the unlimited access to their islands. Uh, and then from that point, from 1946 to 1958, the United States detonated 67 nuclear weapons uh, over the Marshall Islands. Uh, particularly the largest of the nuclear weapons that were developed, the th thermonuclear or, or fission-boosted weapons, leaving behind a great deal of, uh, of destruction, destruct, uh, destruct, destroyed entire islands and widespread contamination. Uh, there are a large number of Marshall Islands people uh, who are nuclear exiles who cannot go to their homelands because they remain contaminated. The United States government d d feels that it's too expensive to remediate this uh, and, and entered into a, an agreement in 1986, uh, presumably to settle all these matters which remain open. Uh, the lawsuit was uh, dismissed in federal court more recently, and uh, it's now being pursued on appeal, and, uh, and is also uh, going on in, in the International Court of, uh, of Justice. Dovetailing with this is what's called the Humanitarian uh, Initiative to Outlaw Nuclear Weapons. 
this is something that has gained momentum that came out of the 2010 Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference. Every five years, uh, the nations who are part of this, uh, this, this treaty uh, are to review the status of the, of the uh, agreement, and it's the, the largest uh, agreement, of, multilateral agreement of its kind dealing with nuclear weapons. Uh, and they basically keyed in on some language that was adopted at that 2010 conference, decrying the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons and calling for states to, quote, comply with applicable international law, including international humanitarian law. Now, those are special terms. International humanitarian law deals with things such as the Geneva Convention and the Code of Conduct of War, uh, ranging from war crimes to other things. So these, these are very important words. Uh, between March of 2013 and December of 2014, there were three international conferences in Oslo, Mexico City, and Vienna focused on the humanitarian effects of nuclear weapons and establishing uh, the, the idea is to establish a new league, international legal, legal instrument that would outlaw nuclear weapons. What they're getting at is, is this huge gap in the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, which was essentially a construct of the Cold War between the two Cold War superpowers, the United States and Russia, uh, then in the Soviet Union. Article 4, while it does call for the, the, the nuclear weapon states who are signatories of the treaty to engage in uh, good faith negotiation to reduce our arsenal, there is no real legal binding requirement beyond that, those, those glittering generalities. So uh, it, 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 to a large extent, the, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty remains an artifact of the Cold War, and there is this huge gap, a legal gap, which does not specify when or how or w what are the terms and conditions of getting rid of these weapons, and, and might they be considered uh, essentially, uh, there used to be considered uh, war crime acts uh, under humanitarian law. These are all big gaps that have to be filled, and this is what this is, these groups are doing. At, in December of last year, the Austrian, Austrian government and 68 other states pledged forward a document called the Vienna Pledge, quote, to fill the legal gap for the prohibit, prohibit, prohibition and elimination of nuclear weapons. Um, this is a very sticky point because uh, uh, there are several nations in Europe under, under the NATO treaty and in Europe who uh, are under what we call the uh, nuclear umbrella of the United States, such as Japan, who are very nervous about this particular uh, framework because uh, it really goes uh, to the heart of, of uh, what our, these governments are doing. This initiative is car exposes a huge loophole, as I mentioned, carved out by the five nuclear weapons states originally. Uh, and as I said, Article 4 in requires the states to engage in good faith nuclear disarmament, but does not require any uh, disarmament or set a timeline in which it should occur. Uh, and this initiative is really a direct answer to the lack of progress. Uh, as you see in this graphic here, you see the United States there are some 19,000 nuclear warheads in the world. Uh, the United States and Russia basically have over 90% of these weapons. Uh, the United States nuclear arsenal, I can speak to more directly, roughly 60% of it is not deployed. 40% of it has been officially discarded by the uh, U.S. military, but it remains intact. And in my opinion, the, U the U.S. nuclear weapons program is engaging in a very dangerous form of hoarding of excess nuclear weapons and, uh, and are resisting their, their, their physical elimination and dismantlement. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and so, but they get away with this because there are no real, unless there are binding agreements to allow them to do this, they will continue to do, to do what they feel. Uh, needless to say, the humanitarian initiative received a chilly, some might say, hostile reception from the nuclear weapon states for an understandable reason. Uh, the United States, Russia, China in particular, are engaged in costly modernization efforts that all but guarantee the continued existence of nuclear weapons for decades, perhaps well through the, this century. And uh, the humanitarian initiative seeks to make nuclear states seriously negotiate towards nuclear disarmament. Currently, the United States is planning to spend 
more than $1 trillion in weapons production, infrastructure, ballistic missiles, subs, bombers, new warheads, uh, actually refurbished warheads. Uh, all these efforts create at least the appearance of the United States and Russia and other countries which are involved in their own nuclear modernization products intend to avoid disarmament indefinitely. This gives you an idea here of what it's been costing the United States uh, for nuclear weapons. What I did here was just simply look at this as if this were a business. What is the per unit cost of a nuclear warhead per year based on what it costs 30 years ago and what it costs now? And as you see, uh, in 1985, uh, we had a, a, an arsenal that was 300 percent larger than what we have right now. And the, the per average per warhead cost was about $353,000, $354,000 a year. We now, uh, our arsenal has dropped by a factor of three or 300 percent, and the cost per warhead has now increased by, by 500 percent. So nuclear weapons are getting increasingly expensive uh, to maintain, uh, and uh, they need, we need to have some sort of control over this. Uh, and we need to start looking at how do we get rid of these things in a serious manner. Now, landmines are banned by international convention because they have proven to be, ex quote, excessively injurious weapons that are indiscriminate and grossly violate international humanitarian war, uh, humanitarian law and the conduct of war. Nuclear weapons are far worse than landmines. I mean, I, I, there is no other instrument of war that exists, that has existed since uh, 1945, uh, that has such a profound destructive uh, impact. Uh, we're talking about destruction of life on the planet, uh, a single bomb that could destroy an entire city, uh, and um, uh, yet uh, these are considered most very desirable instruments of war. It's not subject to any control and not subject to any sort of moral uh, standards, uh, but on April 20, uh, in April of this year, 159 states have formed part of the humanitarian initiative, over 80 percent of the United Nations membership. Uh, support is building worldwide for nuclear weapons to be recognized under binding international law as unacceptable instruments of war that belong in the dustpan of history. Uh, I think you should be paying attention to this particular initiative. The last time we had a serious global movement uh, was during the nuclear freeze campaign of the 1980s that helped sort of, I think, pave the way for uh, the downsizing of the U.S. And, and Soviet arsenals. Before that, I think it's important to know or, or to remember, uh, while we were kids or some of us weren't maybe around at that time, uh, in uh, 1963, the United States, uh, England, and, uh, uh, and, and Soviet Union entered into the first global environmental treaty by banning the explosion of nuclear weapons in the, uh, in the open air and outer space and underwater. Uh, and so we have a tradition to build upon that. Uh, I'm just going to briefly go over the Iranian situation. Uh, to a large extent, the Origins of the problem that, that are, were created, that we're now wrestling with Iran, were actually the seeds were planted by the United States. Uh, the origin of Iran's, Iran's nuclear weapons program basically come from the Atoms for Peace program, where the United States basically provided the rea research reactors, highly enriched uranium, uh, technical know-how, provided education to the. Uh, 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 to, to the nuclear experts of this. And um, following the explosion of the nuclear weapon in 1974 by India, uh, the United States became a, little more, a lot more serious about controlling the spread of nuclear weapons through the Atoms for Peace program. But uh, if any of you are familiar with the Norse myths of, of planting dragon's teeth, um, the, the dragon teeth myth is that once you plant dragon's teeth, dragons will appear uh, from the ground and multiply. And to a large extent, that's what we've done with the Atoms for Peace program. And to a large extent, our efforts to stem proliferation in terms of what we call loose nuclear material and the like are really involved cleaning up after the Atoms for Peace parade of the, uh, starting in the 1950s. The United States basically gave out 
tens of tons of high enriched uranium to countries around the world with the idea of promoting nuclear power or the peaceful atom. And now we're in the process of trying to retrieve that material, uh, and hopefully we can. Uh, in 1967, the U.S. provided the Tehran Research Reactor, which is a key issue right now in the uh, Iranian controversy, a, uh, a small research reactor that basically can produce plutonium. Uh, and it basically was a, is a, a reactor that requires highly rich uranium. This is the primary justification right now for Iran's uranium enrichment pr program. In 2009, because it was expected to run out of fuel after failing to obtain it from France, uh, Argentina, and Russia, Iran declared that it started enriching uranium up to 20 percent. In February 2012, Iran, Iran loaded its first batch of uranium-produced fuel rods into the reactor. This was provided by the United States. Uh, the path for nonproliferation, there's a lot of information here in this slide, but uh, you can see that uh, Iran took advantage of a lot of co cooperation from several countries. Uh, when the United States sort of severed its relationship with Iran in 1980 after the overthrow of the Shah, uh, initially uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini was very adamantly opposed to pursuing nuclear weapons or nuclear power in general. He considered it to be a... Uh, 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 an objectionable thing from a religious perspective. Uh, when he passed away and, uh, uh, and the war began with, between Iran and, uh, and uh, Iraq, uh, Iran shifted towards uh, looking at, at acquiring and developing a nuclear infrastructure. And over a period of several years, uh, basically got a great deal of assistance, particularly after the end of the Cold War, from Russia and China and Russia and China have been major players in helping Iran. Uh, Russia completed construction of a large 1,000-megawatt reactor that's producing electricity that's not part of this nuclear agreement right now, uh, mainly because uh, the, the fuel is being provided by Russia. Once the fuel is irradiated, you know, it produces a certain amount of plutonium. Uh, the, the deal between Iran and Russia is that Russia takes back that spent fuel, so there's no um, issue here about uh, using that spent fuel to extract the plutonium for bombs. Uh, centrifuge is just a very brief discussion. It's basically a cylinder with a rotor in the middle. If you uh, know what a uh, uh, device is to dry out uh, lettuce and spinach, it's based on that same principle except you're driving heavier gas outward at a force million times greater than gravity. And so it basically causes the heavier molecules to accumulate near the wall and the lighter molecules to accumulate close to the stem. And th this is, these centrifuges, have to, there have to be thousands of them. And this, this process has to be repeated over and over and over and over again. Uh, we, do, we now know that Pakistan provided a great deal of know-how and gave a big boost to the Iranian nuclear uh, enrichment program. Uh, here are some events that le led up to the current crisis. Uh, Iran essentially was caught lying about what it was doing uh, and, uh, and agreed to undergo talks. Be keep in mind, by the way, Iran is a signator of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. So uh, go figure. This is, uh, this is what goes on in, inside this treaty. Uh, by May of 2003, Iran produced about uh, 8,960 kilograms of enriched uranium up to 5 percent and about 160 kilograms of uranium up to 20 percent. Uh, when you enrich uranium, uh, uh, once it goes to that 20 percent line, uh, you, it becomes much, much easier, and you start to have an exponential increase in the amount of uranium-235. It's much easier to obtain. Uh, and that an additional uh, centrifuges were found to be operating at a secret military base at the same time. Uh, there, this was basically met with sanctions. International, uh, multinational entities imposed sanctions against Iran. They basically curtailed their oil purchases. Uh, they cut off a lot of flow of banking and commerce. 
Uh, right now, at this time, uh, people living in Tehran have no access to ATM machines. Uh, that kind of banking is just doesn't is for does, is forbidden under the sanctions. Uh, Iran has been u losing a great deal of of, uh, of uh, income, uh, which has been made worse by a declining price in oil. And I think that th this has had a major effect on the desire of Iran to want to negotiate. I also want to step back and remind you, if you follow the news way back when, when. Uh, the George W. Bush administration came to power in 2000. In 2001, 2002, Iran sought rapprochement with the United States. And the United States' response was this, was to declare it a member of the axis of evil. And uh, that slammed the door shut and I think had a great deal to do with Iran's motivation to go nuclear. What the Obama administration is trying to do now is to basically roll that, that back. This could have been prevented, uh, but uh, I think the George W. Bush administration really paved the way and opened the door for Iran to pursue a nuclear weapons office, uh, option by essentially officially declaring them to be an enemy, which the United States might be able to strike militarily. Um, and so Iran is, was thinking about self-defense and also about nuclear weapons being a regional equalizer. Negotiating an agreement. Finally, after the election of the Iranian president, which led to an agreement in November 2013 called Joint Plan of Action, this was a six-month interim agreement to sign, work out a comprehensive solution. China, France, Germany, the Russian Federation, Great Britain, or United Kingdom, the United States, and the European Union are all part of this negotiation process. Uh, this negotiation took effect in January of 2014, and by July of this year, the agreement has been, in terms of the framework, the details of the framework have been sort of worked out. Here are some details. Iran forswears development of <coughs> nuclear weapons and agreement to remain in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, to a large extent, the final agreement hinges on how many of these centrifuges uh, Iran may operate at specific times. It had a, has about 19,000. It has agreed to cut it back to 6,000, uh, which is considered sufficient to allow Iran to produce enough low enriched uranium for its current research reactor program, which, by the way, was initially provided by the United States. Um, the centrifuge stockpile will be reduced over a 10 year period. This is a significant sort of step, I think, in a positive direction. Iran's stockpile of enriched uranium, that 960 kilograms of uh, uranium-235 that's been enriched at 20 percent, will be reduced uh, down to about 5 percent uh, of its total uh, uh, weight. Uh, Iran will reframe and reprocessing of the chemical separation of plutonium from spent fuel. It also agrees to on-site unannounced international inspections and monitoring with a window of time no greater than 24 days. 24 days, that's right. IAEA will be monitoring this for 25 years. Uh, I was involved in securing the spent fuel in North Korea in 1994-95, where we had a, a, a framework agreement with, uh, with North Korea and um, established a, a similar program uh, where the, uh, their spent fuel was placed in the containers. It was subject to 24-7 surveillance and IAEA inspections, and if you recall, this is another thing that the George W. Bush administration effectively blew up uh, and caused it to unravel. Uh, Iran also has a, a, a reactor, a pressurized heavy water reactor, that is, a, these are very uh, efficient producers of plutonium, and they can produce plutonium while, uh, and you can remove the spent fuel while the reactor is operating. Uh, which makes it very, uh, uh, very difficult to detect what, what you're doing there. Uh, Iraq, Iran has agreed to convert this reactor to low enriched uranium, uh, and which, which, which basically greatly reduces the capability and the potential of that reactor to produce plutonium. And the UN and, and European Union sanctions will be lifted once the IAEA verifies implementation of the agreement. Uh, 
I think the likelihood this agreement is going to stick. It's going to pass. The Congress, despite the opposition, does not have enough votes to overcome a, uh, a, a veto of their disapproval. The Congress has 60 days. Even if this agreement is disapproved of, the sanctions that are in place by the European Union and other nations will be lifted. So it isn't that the United States is sort of the major gatekeeper in this. This is a multilateral process. And uh, if uh, the planets are aligned and we are uh, living in a, a time of good fortune, uh, this may also be a much more fundamentally altering situation relative to Iran, the Middle East, the United States. Uh, but that remains to be seen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Um, we're we're going to hold questions until after our second speaker. Um, tonight we have uh, Michael Wally. Um, Michael uh, participated in a uh, plowshares action uh, along with Sister Megan Rice and Greg Borge Obed uh, uh, at the uh, Y-12 nuclear weapons complex uh, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, this, this facility has been known as the Fort Knox of uranium uh, for its um, uh, alleged security. But um, an 84-year-old nun and her two um, cohorts were able to penetrate the facility and uh, mark it with blood, mark it with uh, uh, signs and slogans, and to illuminate uh, just how precarious um, nuclear weapons bring us uh, to, to destruction. And uh, we're, we're very honored to have uh, Mike here tonight to uh, uh, basically tell his story. And after Mike is done, then we'll have um, an opportunity uh, uh, for questions and comments. Thank you. Yes. Hello, my name is uh, <clears throat> Michael Wally. I was, I'm one of the three uh, Transform Now plowshares uh, activists who uh, three years ago this month on uh, uh, July the 28th in the middle of the night, we hours of the, uh, that particular morning, we uh, got to the HEUMF uh, uh, -E building, the Highly Enriched U Uranium Materials Facility building, a multi-million dollar uh, fortress-like building that uh, warehouses, uh, we were told, over uh, uh, about uh, 10,000 um, nuclear weapons of mass destruction worth of highly enriched uh, weapons ready uh, uh, uranium uh, uranium uh, the bombs are not assembled there they are they merely um, uh, uh, process the uranium until it is uh, weapons ready and then ship it to uh, various other locations around the country where it is uh, uh, put into uh, usable um, uh, weapons of mass destruction. This is a photograph of the um, in the news of the myself and my uh, co-defendant. She uh, three years ago, Sister Megan Rice uh, was 82 years of age, uh, so she is now 85. This is Greg Borchi Obed. He's a repeater. He did uh, about six plowshares. He's been very focused on the efforts to uh, uh, eliminate these uh, criminal weapons and to stop the nuclear weapons and mass production uh, activities going on in the U.S. and elsewhere around the world. Uh, we planned the event uh, for months uh, uh, in advance. We discussed many uh, scenarios of what might happen. We uh, had every expect expectation based upon um, information available to the general public that we might succeed in getting to the building that has been uh, uh, boastfully spoken of as the Fort Knox of the U.S. Uh, nuclear weaponry around the world. We got to it. She was 82 years of age uh, uh, when we did it. Um, without, We were undetected. We got to the very building. We made no attempt to enter the building. We had benign lawful intentions. We were... Uh, 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 we made uh, statements uh, about the criminality of a uh, uh, vast array of U.S. government uh, policies, including its continuing noncompliance with the 1968 Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. I understand that that particular site, the Oak Ridge Y-12, uh, located uh, outside of uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, 
that it at one time hosted a uh, visitation by the IAEA, International Atomic uh, Energy Agency. Uh, it's been quite a while since the U.S. government has uh, thrown out the welcome mat for IAEA inspection teams, although the U.S. and other governments are continuing to uh, demand that the Iranians open up their uh, nation to such inspections. This is very uh, unequitable. Uh, we should by all means, as patriotic citizens of the world, uh, support the idea of transparency and the empowerment of the international community to uh, uh, usher in the eradication of uh, weapons of mass destruction. And uh, we should support the rule of international law by all means, and we should uh, uh, not be selective in our outrage against nuclear weapons proliferation uh, by any country, including the, uh, the ones that we happen to be, have been born into. Uh, I don't know what, what else to uh, say exactly. We, uh, it was two months ago today that the three of us were uh, ordered by the uh, uh, Sixth Federal Court of Appeals panel to be released. The, uh, we were, thank you. My uh, prison card. I was, uh, let's see, what was I going to say? We, uh, the, uh, we had a pro bono legal firm, uh, Oric, that uh, Sister Megan had a relative that worked for them, and they got wind of our plight, and uh, as a consequence, they uh, agreed to, uh, on a free of charge basis, uh, do the appeals for us in the Sixth uh, Federal Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati, Ohio, which uh, heard the case. Uh, our uh, uh, defense lawyer pleaded for on our behalf for 15 minutes. The prosecutor, a Roman Catholic, uh, he pleaded, uh, he, he uh, spoke against us uh, as he had at the trial, which occurred in early May of 2013. Uh, so the uh, appeals uh, hearing before the three-judge panel occurred on the, uh, March the uh, uh, 12th, and uh, it was on May the 8th of this year that uh, they uh, overturned the more serious of the two felony uh, charges that uh, we were found guilty of by the 12-member jury on uh, May the 8th of 2013. So when we were, uh, the overturning of the uh, sabotage charge uh, happened on the two-year anniversary of when we were found guilty and taken into custody. So then eight days later on May the uh, uh, 16th, two months ago today, we were uh, uh, released. And uh, see, I don't know what else to say about it exactly. We had uh, prepared it in, for months in advance. Uh, one of the uh, uh, potential uh, uh, potentialities that we discussed was what what if when we got onto the Oak Ridge Y-12 site, which is part of a U.S. government land holding, which uh, includes over 50 square miles, what if we, once we got onto the property, we had a long hike through the woods in the middle of the night? With, uh, she, was, she was taking heart medication, Sister Megan at the time, so you know, very, uh, if we could get there, you can be sure that Al-Qaeda operatives could get there. And that was one of the things we discussed, what, what would happen if we ran into an Al Qaeda um, uh, 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 team, you know, on the site? Who would we surrender to? You know, <laughs> and uh, but we were we 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 did it on the basis of the idea that we could potentially, with the help of God's grace, uh, be successful in uh, getting uh, all of the things we had planned carefully accomplished, which we did. We, we had no intention of uh, doing any mischief. We had benign intentions. We had perfectly legal intentions. We we have one remaining charge uh, uh, that uh, is uh, still being leveled against us. They're going to sentence us again based upon the one remaining charge, which they claim, falsely, that we uh, destroyed government property. Well, the Auschwitz concentration camp fences were part of the illegal activity of the nuclear weapons-seeking Adolf Hitler Nazi government of Nazi-era Germany. 
that the fence, uh, fences around Auschwitz and the other concentration camps were not lawful property. They were part of a criminal misuse, uh, un uh, unjust use of governance powers, and um, so is the U.S. government nuclear weapons activity. They, uh, they have no uh, right to have these weapons. Dr. Martin Luther King died in 1968 in Tennessee. Uh, he had condemned them in life. Dorothy Day, the foundress of the Catholic Worker Movement, one month after the Hiroshima Nagasaki uh, bombings, she condemned the nuclear weapons. Uh, 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 these things are illegal and immoral and ungodly, and uh, they've got to be sent back to hell where they came from. And... Uh, the sooner the better. Uh, uh, there's no such thing as a good nuclear weapon. And uh, the misuse of the name of religion for them, the uh, Islamic bomb in um, Pakistan, the Hindu bomb in India, the uh, Jewish bomb in Israel, the uh, Christian uh, 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 interfaith pro Protestant uh, uh, <laughs> U.S. bomb and French bomb and English bomb and the communist bomb and the capitalist bomb. They're all uh, devilish. They have nothing to do with the common good. They have nothing to do with uh, social justice. And uh, uh, I could say more, but should I open it up to discussion? Or you it's may. I, and I can, I can help you facilitate that. Um, if you have a qu do we have a microphone? And uh, what we'll do is um, we'll uh, share uh, your questions and comments. And if, you'd like, if you have a question, you can please raise your hand. Okay. If, you, if you'd like, you can identify yourself and then uh, direct your question. And then we'll uh, come close to the mic to respond. John Steinbach, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki Peace Committee of the National Capital Area. Just wanted to thank Michael for, for what you guys did. And I've uh, got a couple questions for Bob. Um, I, the one has to do with uh, Iran, and one has to do with uh, some news uh, recently. Last week. So, uh, do you know? If I remember correctly, Iran argued the reason they had to enrich uranium to 20 percent was that there was an international ban on medical isotopes, and so therefore they had to produce their own. Uh, so, I'm wondering, do you know? Did, did they deal with that issue? In the in the negotiations, is that why they're able to, to, to keep some of their 20% enriched uranium? That's correct. Uranium? And that, that research reactor that I pointed out uh, is for uh, can produce uh, medical isotopes. But then again, once the sanctions are lifted, uh, they can have international access to medical isotopes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's the other question. Uh, last week, the Pentagon came out with their what? Uh, annual report, I think maybe three or four year report, uh, where they talk about what what are the plans for the military, and it was pretty predictable, you know, um, lot, lots more wars and so on. But it ended with a note saying that uh, we have to spend a whole lot more money on on modernizing our nuclear weapons program. I don't know if you saw that or not. Yes. And and it was that. Purely propaganda, because my understanding, and I, part of this from you, is that we're spending as much or more now in real dollars than we did when Reagan was president on on that very issue. So why are they asking for more? Well, I think there are a couple reasons. One is that uh, in exchange for garnering a vote in support of the uh, New START arms control agreement between the United States and Russia, the Obama administration agreed to essentially plus up the spending for the nuclear weapons complex, including refurbishment of the production infrastructure, which is very old and antiquated, uh, and the, the, the so-called platforms of delivery, the missiles, the bombers, um, the subs. Uh, that's one explanation. The other explanation is, is that uh, we're dealing with what I call the glacial bureaucratic drift of the Cold War bureaucracy. Uh, presidents come and go, congressmen come and go, but this particular system seems to endure and sometimes thrive. And they are not necessarily under direct control. There isn't all that much adult supervision. Uh, having worked in the Energy Department for a while, uh, you begin to, and having dealt with being oversight of the Energy Department in the Senate, uh, you have to understand that these nuclear bomb factories, Y-12, 
the, the largest and oldest of the weapons project. They, 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 dom they dominate the wage and benefit structures of large geographic areas that make or break statewide elections. And these guys know how to play this card very well. And uh, so it's very difficult to go after them. Uh, the last time uh, <clears throat> the last time there was a serious downsizing of the of the nuclear arsenal was with the end of, end of the Cold War in the late 1980s. And for the first time, uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush uh, asked the mainstream military through the Joint Chiefs of Staff, what should we do with all these bombs and what should we do? And uh, they basically came back in six months with a report that said get rid of as many as you feasibly can. So 6,000 weapons were unilaterally withdrawn independent of any arms control agreement. And the nuclear weapons complex of the Energy Department was downsized by 80% of its installed capacity. Since that time, the mainstream military has not been consulted. Who has been consulted on this are the ones that have the vested interest in it, the Strategic Command of the Pentagon, the Nuclear Weapons Laboratories of the Department of Energy. And they tend to dominate the discussion. And um, I think there's going to be a showdown over time because the costs of, of having a large burgeoning nuclear arsenal the size we have and the costs of maintaining it, as I pointed out, is that even though our arsenal has declined by 300 percent, the cost of these weapons per unit has gone up 500 percent and it's going to keep going up. And this is going to cause conflict within the military in terms of military readiness, other, other military items. And so uh, it's, it, it, it's going to become an actuarial war of sorts. Yeah, Mr. Alvarez, I'd like to address this question to you. Because of your technical expertise and also your experience uh, working with on the Hill, uh, right after this uh, agreement was reached with the, regarding uh, Iran, immediately some of the politicians came out in opposition to it. Uh, mostly Republicans, even some Democrats were very skeptical of it. Now, I've heard some of the leading scientists who, who understand nuclear issues, who understand the technicalities of this uh, agreement, explain why it was really a very soundly constructed agreement. I'm wondering if over this 60-day period, these arguments by people with real expertise in the field are going to have any bearing on these people who oppose the agreement. Can you actually explain the scientific issues to them and make any headway? Uh, well, I mean, you can make that frame that question in the context of global warming. Uh, sometimes facts don't matter. Uh, it has to do with, you know, thinking with your guts instead of your brains. And what's at stake here is a shift in the dynamic of the Middle East, uh, where uh, those of us who were around for a while remember the Shah of Iran when he was in power, and that was the U.S., government strategic military ally for the for the Middle East, not Israel. Israel felt very unhappy about this because this is a Muslim state, a Shiite dominated state. And uh, rapprochement with Iran is looked upon as a greater threat to Israel from a different perspective. And so uh, there's more of an e emphasis of, of vilifying uh, this. And if you see the rhetoric or you listen to the rhetoric of the some of these presidential candidates, uh, Lindsey Graham, if you're tired of war, don't vote for me. Uh, there is a, a strong element within our body politic of, of the right wing conservative militarists who see our nation as bristling with nuclear weapons and in a constant state of war, particularly in the Middle East, where they're, and, and they don't care if it broadens out on a regional basis. Uh, that's their worldview. Uh, it has, a real, in a way, religious connotations, uh, which some of them may not agree to, but uh, once you penetrate that. so. But I think that in this case, Obama holds the Trump card because they cannot muster enough votes to overcome a veto of this agreement, and they all know it. Yes. 
Hi, my name is Paul Magno. Um, I've had the privilege of doing a lot of support work for the Transform Now Plowshares the last few years. Michael, I wanted to, uh, I just wanted to ask you if you could um, share and summarize some of the testimony that Ramsey Clark offered at the pretrial hearing, since he wasn't allowed to testify in front of a jury, about, you know, about the nuclear arms race and about the non-proliferation treaty uh, from his particular perspective, because I thought it was significant testimony, and I th think it's worth sharing. Over nine months went by from uh, when we did the action on uh, July the uh, 28th of uh, 2012 until the uh, start of the trial, uh, which lasted uh, for three days from May the 6th through the, until uh, May the 8th of uh, 2013. Uh, two of the federal uh, government employees, uh, Judge Shelley and uh, Judge uh, Emil Thapar, they put their heads together and they decided uh, uh, on a, a certain listing of certain things that we, the defendants, would not be permitted to raise uh, in defending ourselves when the trial uh, was to start. Uh, what they said international law was not permitted, and God, we could not mention, conscience, religion, uh, the common good, uh, human rights. There's a whole lengthy list of things that we could not mention. Uh, we could only uh, 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 address ourselves to a very uh, limited um, range of issues uh, dictated by the uh, U.S. government. Uh, we were permitted uh, to uh, call uh, various witnesses. One of them was the uh, top law enforcement officer of the entire United States government in 1968, Attorney General Ramsey Clark. He uh, was uh, in office as Attorney General in 1968 when the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was born into existence. The U.S. government signed on to it. Its provisions took effect in 1970. Uh, he said on the witness uh, stand, uh, Chair, uh, under oath, that the United States government was in criminal noncompliance with its legal obligations under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which requires, as you said, to uh, make good faith efforts to eradicate its uh, nuclear weapons arsenal and to, to uh, stop uh, proliferating them. Well, uh, according to this literature here, the U.S. government has uh, multi uh, 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 billions uh, of dollars slated to continue to proliferate nuclear weapons for the next 30 years. Elsewhere, I have read that the U.S. government plans to continue to have a nuclear weapons uh, uh, arsenal on, and to continue to proliferate them until calendar year 2080, which is 112 years after the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was born into existence in 1968. In a word, the United States government is unlawfully uh, uh, continuing to uh, uh, be in non-compliance with its uh, legal obligation to make good faith efforts to stop its nuclear uh, weapons uh, addiction. Uh, the jury, by the way, was not permitted to hear the uh, Attorney General R Ramsey Clark say under oath on the witness stand that uh, the U.S. government uh, was in noncompliance with its legal obligations. Uh, as a matter of fact, under the international law, the Nuremberg uh, pr uh, principles, the uh, Hitler government was trying to get nuclear weapons in uh, uh, Norway during the course of World War II. They were not successful, but as a consequence of the uh, Nuremberg trials after after the defeat of the uh, capitalist, militarist, nationalist, uh, Nazi German government of uh, World War II, uh, they had the Nuremberg trials. Uh, various people were executed uh, for uh, criminal activities and done under the dictates of the, you know, the laws of the Nazi uh, 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 government. And uh, as a consequence of the Nuremberg uh, principles, body of uh, laws that were born into uh, the, the international uh, uh, law uh, structure, the, which the U.S. Senate ratified as part of the U.S. constitutional law under Article 6 of the U.S. Uh, uh, Constitution, I, as a citizen of the world and of the U.S., I have a legal obligation to oppose U.S. government uh, criminal activities which are continuing and uh, with no end in sight and the U.S. government is dictating to other countries including the uh, um, uh, I Iranians and uh, they, they have uh, uh, no intention whatsoever to uh, uh, stop dictating outside of the rule of international law to the rest of the world. Yes, uh, Jay, and then, and then 
Yeah, um, thank you very much for, for coming, Michael. And uh, the Nuclear Free Zone Committee would like to uh, present you with a T-shirt of the sure. Nuclear Free Zone. Thank you. And, and I, do have a, I do have a question. Uh, were you or any of your colleagues who were incarcerated able to spread the word while you were uh, in jail? Were you able to engage some of your fellow uh, prisoners about uh, the reason you were there, and et cetera, et cetera? Uh, yes, I, I tried to uh, continue my uh, uh, missionary strivings as a Catholic. The uh, Pope, uh, Saint Pope John the Twenty Third, before his death on June the Third of 1963, he condemned nuclear weapons. Dorothy Day, the foundress of the Catholic Worker Movement, she condemned the nuclear weapons in 1945. Dr. Martin Luther King condemned the uh, nuclear weapons in uh, 1959 when he was only 30 years of age. We have a wonderful heritage of, uh, um, you know, uh, support for the rule of law and, uh, you know. Uh, the prophets Isaiah and Micah over 2,700 years ago were foretelling the time when we would have total global demilitarization. Uh, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Yes, uh, in answer to your question, uh, uh, at Bradford in uh, the northwestern uh, quadrant of Pennsylvania, there were approximately 1,400 uh, fellow inmates in the main camp, another 300 in the uh, the camp, uh, uh, a stone throw away, a total about 1,700 inmates and a good proportion of them uh, through the grapevine or directly from me uh, found out that I was there because of my uh, opposition to the uh, U.S. government uh, state illegal terrorist uh, nuclear weapons uh, policies. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, for, first of all, the, the references I've heard to, to the, the concentration camps and the Nazi, they're all entirely... Uh, are relevant and appropriate, and, and I would include bi biological weapons. We were looking at, at, at the German and Japanese biological weapons programs, too. Uh, 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 too. Uh, much of what we derived from the Cold War was from the supposed most evil uh, regimes the world had seen. And if the president was here tonight, and uh, as he was la yesterday at the press conference, I would accuse him of the, the high. Uh, uh, he's, he's, he, he represents the heights of hypocrisy in my mind. And he, one of the things he said yesterday was that there are two, there were just two options. One was a diplomacy uh, a ter, to, to, to negotiation, and the other was war. And I would assert that, that, that war it, today is just as genocidal in, in terms of the impact of the weapons and everything, and also the long term devastation. That one nuclear weapon would would, would be, uh, and and my real concern with the, I want to feel good about that that there was a deal made, but my real concern because I was wondering like, why is that, why is there all this support, including the Pentagon and Secretary of Defense, all you know all this there's no opposition, why because they can say, the reason we got this deal is because we have nuclear weapons. And, and, and uh, you know, do, do, do you agree with that? And if so, you know, uh, shouldn't we be, like, talking about the deal in, in, in those terms of, of you know, let, let's now do what we are, are, are uh, what the president himself had said, had called for when he won the Nobel Peace Prize. He gave a speech at the U.N. And I I'd, I'd want to go back and read that speech and see what he said, compare it to what he said yesterday. A person could get very confused uh, you know, listening and uh, researching the various contradictory things that President Obama has said about nuclear weapons. He, he hates them, and yet he uh, is helping to proliferate them for uh, decades into the future. Uh, he is not of one mind. As for me as a Christian, I, I want to accept Jesus' uh, peace offer. He said, my peace I give you not as the worldlings would give it, and uh, when Jesus comes, he comes with equity, one size fits all, the international uh, body of laws is for all of the nations, we should not be uh, dictating to some nations and re uh, permitting the uh, this criminal uh, non-compliance with the rule of international law by other uh, nations, such as the United States government, is very uh, uh, illegal, immoral, undemocratic, and unpatriotic. Ian Barkley.
And I would like to thank Michael, first off, for his courage and his conviction in doing what they did and for revealing the fact that the emperor had no clothes down there. You folks were able to penetrate, what, three different perimeters, I believe it was? Four fences. And Four fences. And we had uh, over a quarter of a mile walk uh, through the uh, upper ridge and down a ridge in the middle of the night. Yeah, we had to walk through uh, over a quarter of a mile up a ridge and down a ridge uh, in the middle of the night uh, uh, to get to the building. But the thing is, we planned it very carefully based upon information that is available to every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the world. With, we, we planned it with the uh, idea that we might, with the help of God's grace, be successful in accomplishing our missionary work. And uh, we, we prayed to God uh, you know, that we could do it. And uh, for years and years, they were, uh, the U.S. government was saying that this was the Fort Knox of the uh, uh, U.S. nuclear uh, weaponry. Well, uh, the 82-year-old at the time, none got there. And uh, I'm sure Al-Qaeda could get there. The Ku Klux Klan could get there. The American Nazi Party could get there. Any Tom, Dick, or Harry, the, uh, the, the campfire girls could have gotten there. <laughs> and I also want to inquire if it's my understanding that the guard who did eventually come upon you folks was required by his rules to have shot you, and he didn't, and uh, thank God, and that he was subsequently disciplined or fired for, for that? He was the only employee there. He was making something in excess of $50,000 a year. Nobody paid Sister Megan, who had done the missionary work in Africa for over uh, 40 years, by the way. Nobody paid her uh, for, uh, for her work uh, on behalf of the common good and on behalf of the international law. Uh, to my understanding, he was the only single employee there. See, there are thousands of uh, employees operating the um, Oak Ridge Y-12 site. There's another designation K something there. The whole site is over 50 square miles uh, uh, in the, uh, the uh, you know, I lost my train of thought here. But anyway, the, uh, the uh, over, there are several thousand employees work there and he was the only one, uh, Officer Garland, he had formerly been uh, our employee at the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons site in Colorado years ago and he knew very well, he said himself that we were not terrorists, he knew that we were peace activists, he did not uh, take out his uh, handgun and, uh, and kill Sister Megan and uh, apparently he would not have been fired if he had shot her dead. Right, that, that's the the total insanity of our whole process that that would have been a kudos to you thanks for protecting in uh, quotes our facility so I, I really thank you and I really mean what I said when I say thank you for your fearlessness thank you and thanks for coming to our fair city the people's Republic there was one th one I did have one question um, uh, in my own mind's eye the uh, uh, is it your area of expertise international law? No. Oh, does the I I see the, the IAEA uh, uh, does it try to enforce the provisions of the 1968 nuclear non-proliferation treaty uh, relative to Iran as a signatory to that particular international law? It's um, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, as I said, is a throwback to the Cold War. And so you actually have the haves and the have-nots. The haves are the weapon states, and as you pointed out, there were some IAEA visitations, which were actually we started in 1994, uh, which the G.W. Bush administration pulled the plug on uh, at Y-12. Uh, the, the enforcement and of, of IAEA uh, inspections. It's not uniform or consistent. It really is more oriented towards trouble spots. I mean, the IAEA's budget is less than that of the Washington Redskins. So it really, you know, it, and, and the United States spends, a pay, pays for about 60 to 70 percent of its budget. It's the way it works. The problem here is a structural problem having to do with with Ramsey Clark has pointed out as a lawyer, is that well, I know I don't know the law that well. I do know the United States and the weapon states carved out a loophole in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty that you can drive a uh, a convoy of 
trucks through uh, to allow them to do as they please in terms of size and scope. Now, having said that, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty can be changed, and it can be changed. Those who are not familiar with Article 5 of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, that uh, approves of peaceful nuclear explosions. Those are now outlawed. And that, that visualization you saw didn't include the PNEs. Uh, one of the first fracking uh, experiments was done with a nuclear weapon in New Mexico called Shot Gnome. Uh, but they, they discovered that the, radio, the gas was so radioactive that uh, the biophysicists at Lawrence Livermore declared it as biologic insanity to use it, and they stopped doing it. But uh, the point I'm making is that, is that it's going to take more than characters like me or Ramsey Clark arguing the finer points of law or or the technicalities of this. It's going to take a, a political movement, and it's going to have to be international in scope and dimension. And what I'm trying to point out to you is that the, internet, the humanitarian initiative is possibly, perhaps, and in my opinion, the most viable uh, vehicle we ought to start getting onto. Um, and I'd like to, uh, I have a quick question to follow up on that. Bob, can you um, illuminate for us the, the next steps in the, this humanitarian initiative? Well, I don't really know that what the next steps are going to be because this involves nation states and not NGOs. But uh, the NGOs have been paying attention to their next meeting. Uh, there is a continued recruitment effort going on in the UN. Uh, I think that what uh, communities like Tacoma Park can do uh, is to get resolutions through the city council to support the humanitarian initiative, to encourage their members of Congress, their elected officials, to do the same. Um, the uh, I'm not. I'm, I must admit that I'm not all that well connected to this humanitarian initiative, but I must say that I see it as having great potential, and it's worth our while to sort of learn more about it as much as possible. There's actually a great deal of information about it on the Internet uh, that it can be made available. Julie? Yeah, wait for, wait for Mike, Julie. Uh, okay. I had a... Okay, we'll have a your, your I, I just had a quick question, which is in terms of public uh, knowledge of the situation, uh, the mainstream media doesn't seem to be very helpful. And, uh, you know, if you watch Democracy Now! or something, you might have a better perspective about this. But um, it seems like grassroots movements are the things that are going to make a change unless there's some way of of getting a broader audience uh, for the facts. I don't disagree. Yeah, I had a question for Bob about the, um, the landmine movement and the success of the landmine movement. I wonder if you'd discuss that for us and, and tell us how it might apply to our situation. Well, first of all, the landmine movement was, again, I think has very direct linkage to the humanitarian initiative because it basically is uh, goes to the, the uh, what's called humani international humanitarian law regarding the conduct of war. And this is, this is a very formalized system in place. And it took a while, but it, uh, the landmines were banned and or considered basically war crime instruments. Yeah. And it, it, had to t it took on a great deal of international pressure. Celebrities became involved, Princess Diana, others, to draw attention to it. And we need to have that kind of focus and attention with the landmines. Now, that, having said that, this was something that didn't happen in a year. It took 30, 35, 40 years for this to come about. So... Uh, we have to think of the in these terms. I mean, the the nuclear weapons program is thinking in 50 to 80 year time frames, uh, and we as activists or whatever have to somehow think about that and how do we maintain and and restore institutional memory, uh, things like that. You know, 
are all very important, and uh, we have to think in those terms. Okay, any other questions, mm -hmm. comments? Okay, well, thank you all very much for coming tonight. We really appreciate the opportunity, and thank you, Michael. Thank you, Robert. Good night.